So assuming everyone can see uh, this data in front of us, I've got a very simple model with a series of uh, ponds. And <clears throat> if I click the 3D view, it pops up in the 3D viewer. Now, anybody who's been with us for a little while uh, may think that's perhaps not quite as crystal clear as the previous 3D viewer. So if anybody wants to, you can actually get back to the whole old 3D viewer by holding down Shift and then pressing the cube icon at the same time. And as you can see, um, the settings in the old 3D viewer are actually hard-coded to uh, allow us to see the the, tra uh, the change in the undulations in these 3D surfaces a bit clearer than they would initially appear perhaps in our new 3D view. The reason being is that the new 3D engine is actually lighting the scene more realistically and as such we need to adjust some settings depending on what we're doing with it. So I'll start just by dragging these properties over here a little bit and I'm going to go to the lighting tab. So as I said, in the old system, the lighting was fixed. Here we here we have the ability to change its direction and its intensity. So at the moment, it's on sunlight and can't really see a massive amount. So what I'm going to do is quickly just switch back to the first tab and untick strings. And, yep, not a lot there. So if I now go back to lighting, and I flick it onto headlight, and then I'm going to change this diffuse value here and you should now see the data leaping out, uh, the terrain leaping out at us, whereas before it was perhaps a little hidden. Something else that helps, uh, um, what's the word, highlight uh, the relief in a, in a terrain is the is the color that it's using, and it helps to use a color uh, which is quite light and bright, so it contrasts in the shadows. So the first uh, box in the properties down the left-hand side here, it says color. That can easily be changed, and I can just choose, for instance, I'll go for a, a lighter sort of blue, or I can go custom, and I can try and find a color. Shall we find one, try and find one similar to what we had before? Uh, let's go down somewhere like that. There you go. So that's the new engine using colors to the old engine. So in the old engine, uh, you couldn't really control the center of rotation. You just span it around the uh, the extent of the model. Now you have a lot more control over where you pivot and where you you change uh, your rotation about. If I hold down Control and click, it will now change and orbit around that area. So as I was saying, you can use Control to click anywhere on the model, and that will focus the view around that point. As you roll the ball in and out, you should be able to see uh, obviously the model get bigger and smaller. If I right click, it will pan up and down. And if I hold the roller ball down, it will actually pan in any direction I like. So that's the, the general controls to the view and moving around the, the, the models just going to discuss the various display options. So the first tab in the top left hand corner says triangles. So obviously if I untick that I don't see anything. Below that we have strings. Again I tick that and it will actually render the 3D strings in the color that they are actually drawn in the in the 2D view. If I turn off strings and enable contours again you'll see the contours exactly as they were rendered in the 2D view. And depending on your background color, you may or may not see much in the way of the contours themselves. So again, if I go to triangles and untick that, again, you can see the contours a little bit more clearly. Um, again, to give it some contrast, if I go to background color, change that to black. Again, that might also help um, highlight the contours a bit more clearly for you. Change that back to white. Turn the triangles back on. So we've looked at the, the model as it first appears to us with our standard uh, color that we've chosen to render it. If I come down from there, we have a display mode. So obviously normal means, as you expect it to be, normal. 
Below that, we can switch it to a wireframe. And below that, we have height shaded. So this is the same height shading that you see in the 2D view. So if I quickly switch into the 2D view here, use Alt and F9, and just enable shading. And just turn off the triangles. Okay, so that shading is calculated in exactly the same way as this shading. And we can adjust it from here as well. If I drop down height shading and double click on settings, I have the same settings that you would normally expect to see in the model. So I can say, instead of highlighting, uh, sorry, plotting a color band every half a meter, every quarter of a meter, I could say uh, every one meter, and the colors change. So back to 0.2. The colors again can be adjusted with the lighting. So if they're not bright enough, or not vivid enough, you can adjust the ambient light as well to try and increase um, the, uh, the contrast if you need to. Back to the home tab at the top uh, below where it says water, which we'll come to in a later, we have a shading key. So if I enable the shading key and drag that up, you can see it's plotting for us a little key that I can click and drag. So to scale it, I just hold up the top and move it up and down, or just click and drag and move it anywhere on my screen. Uh, 0.2 is probably too much to uh, annotate it at, so let's say 0.5. And there you go. So that's height shading. You've got height shaded wireframe. So similar sort of thing, but rather than shade the triangles, you can obviously uh, so rather than flood fill the triangles, we just uh, color in the edges. And again, if I go to a background color, that leaps out a little bit better for you. So you've got to bear in mind, if we are plotting lots of different colors on the screen, that your background color will obviously have an effect on that as well. Put that back to white. Okay, now the final options are textured and aerial image. We'll cover the aerial image in just a moment. But textured allows us to uh, assign a material or an image over the entire surface and because I've uh, already been playing with this it's actually assigning a texture to the entire surface and if I zoom in you should be able to see that looks like rubble. The textures that we're using, if I turn off the shading key, are essentially seamless, text, seamless images. Um, these images can be easily found on the internet, but we can't uh, unfortunately ship them with the software because if we did, we'd have copyright issues. So what I'm going to do is rather than uh, texture the whole thing the same, is I'm going to use groups to actually control what part of the model uh, is textured in, uh, so is uh, assigned a particular image. So I'll set that back to normal and close down the 3D view, and then here. I'm going to go and turn my triangles back on and tick shading. So, groups for anybody who isn't aware are accessed through this icon in the top left hand corner. Uh, normally you won't have anything, it'll just say unassigned, but I've been playing with this already. So, I'm going to go to groups and I'm going to add a new group and I'm going to call this one water. and add another one, and I'm going to call this one grass. So let's give a standard fill style, whoops, not water, it's called grass, uh, banking, and half set water to water. Okay, so normally that's what we would do, and you'll assign, tech, uh, assign the groups to the various triangles, and you can then calculate different area and volume calcs and have everything split up nicely for you. Here, you may notice that we have another box beside the fill star, which says texture. And if I come down on water and select, say, clear water as an image, and under grass, I shall, I shall just choose grass. Those are the textures that are actually going to be used to flood fill the triangles when I go into the 3D view. The textures themselves, though, aren't, as I said, shipped with Enforce. These are up to yourselves to go and source. But they're very easy to come by. I'll just show you that now. So if I go into, uh, into the internet, I'm just going to search 
of seamless textures. And if I click on images, you can see they're very easy to come by, <coughs> very easy to come by, and there's obviously a multitude of them that you can choose from. If you want to use one of these images, all you need to do is click on it so that you can obviously get a higher resolution of it. Right click it and choose save image. So I'm using uh, Google Chrome, but I'm assuming that the other engines obviously do something similar. So if I say save image, and we want to go to the folder called textures, which is off of our standard uh, uh, Nforce settings folder. So normally you would get to that from the desktop, and you'll have uh, Nforce support files, and in there you'll have settings, and in there a folder called textures. So this is the folder that I've already saved some images and sorry textures to. I'm just going to now change this to say uh, grass paved. So the standard uh, name is a bit silly. Press save. That's now been saved. Now I won't be able to see that image. Don't think I will only. Don't we'll be able to see it until I go back in. So I the groups. Oh, I didn't save it. Silly me. Grass. Add water. So I'll make that water. That to clear water. Grass. That's fine. Let's just choose grass. And there was grass paved. OK, that. So water becomes my current group. OK, that. Now we use these icons here, these yellow triangle icons with a blue plus. And I'm going to say uh, by boundary. So I'm going to add triangles to the group by a boundary string. And by boundary string, I basically mean a feature. So if I zoom in, there's one, there's another one. Another one and another one. So there's my my four ponds grouped up to uh, to group everything else up. And give that uh, the grass texture. I'm going to use a little trick and lock the water so I can't uh, reallocate any triangles that are assigned water. Zoom out and then just go add by rectangle. Collect everything else and that's now coloured in in our grass group. By now going into the 3D view, we should see something a little bit more textured. Now, again, the lighting will have an effect here, and so will the, uh, the texture you're using. <coughs> so if I expand the group section here on the left, you can see the two groups we have. And under grass, you can see it says textured. And again, if I expand texture, it's set to grass too not too late to change that texture. We can do it in either the group dialog in the 2D view or we can change it here. So if I was to change this one to grass lawn, there you go. You can see how the texture yourself, the texture that you're using has a bearing on how um, the actual terrain surface actually looks. So that was changing the texture there. Now textures aren't all the same size. Depending on the original size of the image, you may or you will probably definitely have to change its repeat scale. So if I set that to 1, you'll see that it becomes almost uh, a greenish blur. If I set it to something ridiculous, say 100, maybe even 200, it becomes very pixelated and not particularly uh, fit for purpose. But if I set it to about 25, I think it was, and zoom in, and it seems to do the job. Likewise with the water, if I expand the water group, expand the texture section, that's also set to 25, that's just coincidence, I set it to 50, or 100, it'll have a different effect. So you'll need to decide yourself what sort of <coughs> what sort of size works with the various images that you have. 
I'm using images at the moment that are essentially rotationless. You can essentially have them at any angle. But if I was to actually use a texture which had an orientation, for instance, let's say I've got one thing here called brick. There we go, brick wall. There you go. We can see now that I can actually, uh, there are times when I'll need to change the orientation so it matches my surface. Now, obviously, you wouldn't have bricks necessarily lying down on the ground like this, but you can create near vertical faces in the Enforce DTM, and the software will map the texture perpendicular to the face. So if you have an almost vertical face, by putting brick on it, it will look like a brick wall because it will be mapped perfectly um, onto it. In which case, though, you probably will need to change the rotation. So the rotation field down here in the bottom left allows us to do that. So if I put in 45, hopefully it will change, and it does. I'll put in 35. Okay, so by varying the rotation, you can make the image better suit the uh, triangles that it's actually assigned to. You may need to create multiple groups um, if you've got different walls um, because they won't all have the same rotation. So you'd have to create a different group for each surface if that was the case. If I zoom out so we can see everything again. If I want to now suddenly do a screen grab, in the old system, you'd have to do print screen. Now, however, there's actually a button that says screenshot. Okay, and if I click that, you can very quickly just press OK and it'll create a, a JPEG of whatever you have on the screen at the time being. You'll notice that you can also override the size though. That's to enable you to actually generate an image uh, a much larger resolution than you'll ever be able to get on your screen. Reason being that if you want to be able to plot these large, say if you want to be able to plot them on an A1 or an A0 sheet, if you were to take a screen grab and blow it up that size, it will look incredibly pixelated uh, at a distance. Uh, it may look fine, but if you got close, it would obviously look a bit weird. So by <coughs> overriding these uh, values here, you could say, go for something like, I don't know, 4,000 by 3,000. And that will allow you to generate a much higher res image that when you then plot on a standard A1 or A2 sheet, it'll remain nice and crisp and clear, and it won't look blurry. If you want to switch back to the rendering that we had before, you'll notice that the groups are now taking care, sorry, taking precedence over the rendering that I had before on the screen. So at the moment, even though the triangles are set to yellow, the groups are essentially overriding that. To actually override the groups, there's a button here which actually says override groups. If I tick that, it'll go back to doing what it was doing before. So if you want to do a uh, height shaded view, you can do. Take a screen grab of that and um, then just switch the override off and go back to you know, creating nice textures and uh, 3D models. A quick word on height shading. When you have very, very large models, especially the LiDAR services that we'll get to in a second, the, the triangles actually are individually shaded. And when you output a, a drawing to AutoCAD, that shading actually creates lots and lots of little uh, hatches which go into the D, well, DWG now and can massively bloat that file. And they'll, uh, they'll affect the redraw time in Enforce because it's having to essentially calculate the height shading in real time for each triangle. So to get around that, in the new version in 3.2 that's coming out shortly, there's actually going to be uh, a little workaround. And what we can do is we can actually flick the system uh, into height shading mode. So I'll do that. And then if we say change the view by clicking above here, in fact, you can change it to any, any uh, compass direction you like. But if I just say above, that is now looking at it perfectly vertically down. And in 3.2, you'll be able to press screenshot, and it will create an image, but it'll also generate the uh, coordinate information that's needed so that you can create uh, a backcloth and actually use that as the background to a model or a, a drawing in Enforce that will obviously be way, way quicker because it's not having to calculate the, the rendering anymore. And it'll keep your file sizes down to a minimum because it's not having to create thousands and thousands of little hatches to, to mimic this hatching. 
So that's a little trick that's coming forward uh, for you in, in 3.2. Up till now, all we, we really we, uh, all we have been dealing with is a, a static view that we can spin around and view from any angle, so that we can over make the uh, presentations a bit more interactive. We can actually create simple animations with this in interface as well. So the simplest animation is probably just a, a straightforward orbit. And if I go to video, I can start to create uh, paths and uh, orbits around certain points. So if I do that by going to point, and if I click pick target, and click somewhere on the drawing, sorry, somewhere on the 3D view, it will drop the center of rotation to wherever I'm clicking on my model. So click pick target, and I'm going to click there. Below that we have the radius about which we will rotate the job, uh, rotate the camera, sorry. So I'm going to say, I should say 150. And then if I click orbit target, you can see it's now put a cyan line on the screen that represents where the camera's going to go. And if I now click the eye icon in the top right hand corner, what it's going to do, it's going to snap that camera so that I'm actually looking or I'll change my view so I'm snapped to what the camera's seeing. So if I click that, we're essentially looking at the view side on. Okay, we can't really see very much in this view. So you'll notice that in the middle of the screen there's an offset box. At the moment the offset is zero. So if I put in there five meters and then click apply offset, it'll come up. If I hit it again, it'll offset it by another five meters. And so on and so on, and so on. Now to actually run the animation, you just press play. So that's running now, and hopefully you'll see your screen update. Now, internet being what it is, you may see something that's super smooth, or you might see something which is a bit jerky, but I assure you, my end, it's, it's smooth as silk. If I pause that, that was rotating uh, 20 meters a second. I can slow it down so I could say go to 5 meters a second and it will barely move. Or I can go the other end, say go 50. Okay, that's just a simple orbit around a point. If I then stop, the camera will go back to where it was before. If you are generating animations, and uh, we'll come to the video part in a minute, but if you want to create the animation but hide the route the camera's about to take, there are tick boxes up here that say show path or hide path, and you can very quickly just toggle that so that you don't have to see where you're going if you don't want to. We can also have multiple views, sorry, multiple models in the 3D view. If I take off the camera path and then flip back to the project manager, Something which um, is becoming more and more of a tool in Enforce uh, is the ability to drag and drop different data sets. Now you can drag and drop models to backlog them very quickly. So if I click this model here called Tops, click and hold my mouse and just drop it into the 3D view, and click 3D view, you can now see that it's added that data set to the model. If I go to the 2D view and do Alt B, what it really did was add Tops to the model. But all I've done really is do Alt B and put it in there, but because I have the 3D view open, it also added it to that as well. If I collapse the section here on the left, you can see I now have two, two models, and each of those has its own properties. If I expand tops, and if I click over I group, because I've got some groups in there, and change that to normal, you can see we have something sitting on top but we can see through them because we also have an opacity setting now. So if I put that back to 100, you'll just see some grey blobs. If I allow those to be transparent by setting that to about 50%, you start to see through it. So the opacity setting is obviously going to be useful where you're doing design work and you want to be able to show a new design on top of an old surface and see the, obviously see the two action, uh, interacting together at the same time. The opacity works well here because the design is above the uh, is above the model, so we can see through it. 
if it was the other way around and this was a hole, obviously it wouldn't make any. I wouldn't be able to see anything because the the primary model would be in the way. So because of that, there's another tick box here which says always visible. And if you tick that, then it'll have precedence. It'll it'll be the one that's shown um, instead of the other one. Uh, if I tick it now, nothing really will happen because I got it set to transparent. But if it was a hole, you would then see the hole, and the model above would obviously uh, would, uh, not be drawn. Right. So the three D view, I put that back to one hundred. And now, if I go down to its texture mapping settings, we have shaded wireframe. So this is using a group. Sorry, there's a group called grass on this model, and it's been shaded for the wireframe. If I put that back to normal, there we go. So it's set to yellow. If I set that to textured. We see the grass again. And if I expand texture, change that to something else, say marble. There you go. So you can have some real you know, you can create some real funky psychedelic uh, animations and uh, models if you want to. Don't necessarily have to be realistic, but the textures you use are entirely up to you. That's just playing with simple um, terrain, uh, normal topographic surveys. What we're going to move on to now is loading LiDAR data, much larger data sets and assigning error photos and the like to those. So I'm going to close that down. File new. Okay, so I'm going to start by reading in a LiDAR surface. And by LiDAR surface, I mean a gridded data set. And we can create these gridded data sets now from LiDAR data, uh, sorry, from point cloud data, uh, especially LAS files. And we provide a little utility to do that. So if I just quickly show you what a LiDAR file looks like if you haven't seen one before, if I go to my desktop, uh, go to other file. Okay, so what I'm loading in now is essentially UAV data. I'm going to give it the aerial photo. This format, this image, sorry, is in an ECW format, which is essentially a, a very well compressed TIFF or JPEG. And I will cut it up so it responds a bit more. So there's the image. And here is the data set to go with it. Okay, now if I zoom in more, we should hopefully start to see the grid. If I press Alt F9 and turn off the triangles, you see the grid disappears. Let's try and find an area with a bit more of a contrast. Alt F9, turn off the triangles. Okay, so you can also see on top of that the contours have been generated for us, but the data set itself is just a grid of levels and the grid is draped over uh, the point cloud using a piece of software which we ship with Enforce and if I just quickly show you that is, so that's in the utils folder underneath our standard Enforce support files. And if you double click that it starts by asking you what, what size grid you want to use so obviously to set that however tight or large you want uh, if it's a really, really, really big file, you can actually speed things up uh, because if it's if you're draping a half meter grid over it, you don't necessarily need to load 100% of the data. You could probably get away with 20% of the data and still get the same result because it'll just obviously discard anything that's not on grid. Then you'd click Open and Convert, and then you can obviously use text files, but LAS is the preferred. Give it the LAS file, and it will chew away on the LAS and spit out a ASC file. And that's exactly what you are asked to import in Enforce when you select LiDAR. It'll default to ASC files. And that's a standard ESRI format. We have that's not our format, that's just a standard text file really, which is a grid of levels and an origin. And because it's on grid, it's incredibly fast. Enforce doesn't have to do any triangulation, it just has to draw the data on grid. Um, just because it's a grid, though, doesn't mean to say we can't use it um, uh, for anything else. So if I go calculate uh, along here, I can quickly draw. Right click, and there we go. So that is a section through the LiDAR data. Oops, didn't mean to do that. So if I 
look at the, I don't know if you can see it, I'll try and zoom in so you can see it. So as I move over the data set, it's actually highlighting in the plan view where I'm sectioning it, as you would expect it to. And that can obviously be saved and plotted like any normal section, or we can do volumes with it. So the reason for coming in here is to get into 3D. Now, this is where you need a reasonably fast computer. Because what we have to do is we have to cut that image up into lots of small chunks and then dice it over the terrain set. Now, this data was collected via a client of ours who kindly uh, donated it to us. It's a, a Trimble fixed wing drone that was flown. I think it took about half an hour to collect this kind of data, and then it took about 12 hours processing overnight. But fundamentally, this is a surface like any other in Enforce, and as such, we can texturize it, we can height shade it, just as you would normally. If I go to uh, the display mode and set it to aerial image, it will use the ECW file or the JPEG or the TIFF that you gave it before. ECWs are much faster, but you can still use uh, standard TIFFs and JPEGs that you'll get out of um, packages like Pix4D and Agisoft. Um, I'd recommend if you are doing this kind of work that you uh, get a package called Global Mapper because that has the ability to read in uh, the GeoTIFFs and uh, JPEGs and convert them into an ECW and you'll find it's a lot, 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 lot faster. So having done that, I'm going to now create another animation and show you how easy it is to just create a bespoke fly through. So if I zoom out and go up to video, I click path, because I obviously want to create a path. We can click a feature that we've already surveyed, but I'm just going to click away on the screen. Uh, just in case, I'll clear any previous animation. And every point I click will be offset five meters above the surface. So I'll click pick points. And let's start down here somewhere. You see it's drawing me a camera. Let's go up here. Come out. You'll notice that there are times when I try and click and nothing happens. It's because I've actually held the mouse down too long and it started rotating it. So to prevent that, you can hold down Shift and that will lock it. And then right click to cancel. So to preview that, all I have to do is click the eye icon and then press play. Now again, I appreciate that it's going to look pretty jerky over the internet. But again, your end at least, it will be super smooth. All the animations that we do, uh, obviously you can give to anybody else and anybody in force and they'll be able to view them. If I stop that, we'll go up the top. But the animations themselves are part of Enforce Pro and Designer. However, if you want to give the, the animation to someone else, someone who hasn't got Enforce at all, you can record it to a video. So, uh, as with old VHS and Betamax, for anyone who's really old like me, you can hit record. It'll ask you for a file name, so I press save. And then it will say, what uh, codec do you want to use? So an animation is just essentially a series of stills compressed into an animation. If you use full frame, essentially what that means is every single frame is going to be 100% detail and you're going to use up an awful lot of hard drive, hard drive space. We would recommend downloading and installing instead the XVID MPEG codec. That's a uh, much more efficient uh, codec which will compress the, the individual frames into, a, into an AVI or an MP4 and it'll be pretty much crystal clear and the file will probably be a tenth if not smaller than the original file size. Again though we cannot distribute the XFIG codec for copyright reasons so if you Google XFIG codec should find it quite easily at the top of Google. So 
download and install that and then you can use that here. There's one issue with that though and there is a small bug in the codec, not in Enforce. So what you need to do is once you've installed the XVID codec, press configure and go to other options and just untick the first two tabs on the encoder tab. Without that, Enforce may crash. Um, but otherwise it could be fine. So I'm going to just OK that. And I'm not going to generate the animation because it'll take a while to do it, but essentially that will be created offline and we can just watch that any time we like. Okay, now hopefully you'll have seen that this is fairly responsive and I'm running this on a, on a laptop, which is uh, it's an i7 laptop, but it's a couple of years old now. Um, the only upgrade it's had is a little bit of memory, it's got 32 gig of RAM and a very, very quick uh, SSD. Those that don't know what that is, that's a solid state drive. So we're using memory uh, instead of physical hard drives these days. Now, as I zoom into the data, it'll actually start to get a bit pixelated. I'll just try and find a car somewhere that looks a bit ropey. There we go, you can see that hopefully. Looks a little bit iffy. That's because the quality of the image I'm using at the moment is only set to 10% of its original uh, quality. If I flick back, let's just see roughly where that is. Okay. If I flick back to the 2D view and zoom into the same area, let's get rid of the triangles and the contours. I think that's this car here. You can see there's actually a lot more information. Uh, that we're not seeing. So, as a result, what we need to do is we need to bump up the resolution that we're using uh, in 3D view. The downside of this is that this requires an awful lot of number crunching and uh, a lot of video memory, and it can take a while to do it. So, I'm not going to go 100%, but I will go 50%. And as such, Enforce will warn me that I'm about to essentially generate an enormous image, and it's going to take a little while to to uh, properly cut it up and load it in. So I'm going to press OK, and hopefully in a second or two we should see that increase in clarity. There you go. So it's now doing that all over the job, and it's going to be a little bit unresponsive as I try and zoom out because it's loading the data everywhere. But the end result being that you can now fly around the data set and see a lot more information even perhaps digitize some of it. So where I do have data sets like this, we have a digitize button that actually allows us to pick information off of the 3D view. And this is being used quite extensively by clients who are going out with UAVs and collecting drone data, and then sketching around the bottom of batters and the tops of batter, generating a very quick and easy volume without actually having to go on site and climb up them and uh, worry about any health and safety. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly create a new model and just show you how easily we can digitize off of this model in the 3D view. So back to here, otherwise new, normal, just call it roads, and then I'll just quickly backlot it with the LiDAR. view. Now I've got to wait for it. This is taking a little bit longer because it's remembered the, the quality setting that I had before. There we go. So what I'm going to do is just quickly show you that how, how we can uh, digitize off of the 3D view and obviously interpolate levels onto the uh, terrain as we go. So I'm going to go digitize. It's already set the new feature. I'll just call my feature RD. Click select points and then just click on the screen. And hopefully you can't see it I don't think in the over the net but there are there although there is line work appearing on my screen. If 
I now just count for that, unclick select points, and go back to the 2D view, get rid of the back loss, so you can see. There you go. There's the uh, data that I digitized. That's the 2D. That's the 3D. Um, so like I said, with drone data especially, that's becoming a very useful way of digitizing around the, the, uh, the bases of spoil heaps and extracting volumes without ever really having to go up there and get your feet dirty. So that's going to, that actually finishes the little presentation. Um, hopefully you've, uh, you've learned something or you've seen something Enforce can do that you didn't know it could do. Uh, is there any questions anybody has with regards to what I've just been doing? What was the water option? Yes, you were reminded me. So the water option shows you a, a plane, a uh, simple 3D plane that you can adjust the height of. So if I go up here, click on home, click water, it's put a, a plane in at the level zero. So if I change the level to say five, that comes up. And obviously it's by default it's made slightly translucent so you can see through it. Uh, it works quite well here because obviously we can see uh, the water level coming in as if it was a uh, high tide. So that's at five, go to two, to one, and zero. Uh, future releases will be able to animate that hopefully as well so you'll be able to show water or any other surface going up and down so you could actually model a floodplain uh, which will be have a slight hydraulic gradient to it doesn't necessarily have to be completely flat and that brings me to the end uh, it's four o'clock uh, thank you for your time again if you have any any questions file them you know fire them through uh, the normal avenues email and whatnot and we will do more webinars on different topics in the future. If you can think of uh, any topics you'd like to see in a webinar, please let us know. Um, but for the time being, um, I'll say goodbye and we'll see you all later.